Um, welcome to this session on conflict and global Britain. I'm Sally Lockwood, a news correspondent for Sky News. And this is uh, an issue uh, very close to me, uh, this session being hosted by uh, the world's biggest landmine clearance charity, the Halo Trust. Uh, I spent six months embedded with NATO troops in Afghanistan in 2013 and 2014, so was uh, delighted uh, to be invited to take part today. Uh, now, this it aims to be a conversation about why conflict is important to the UK in terms of the country's values, uh, the economic impact, and the impact on security. How can Britain be a force for good? What does the public think? And indeed, what do you think? Now, let me introduce, first of all, our four panellists. We have uh, Fabian Hamilton, MP, Shadow Minister for Peace and Disarmament. Welcome to you. Mandy Turner, Professor of Conflict, Peace and Humanitarian Affairs at Manchester University. Shabnam Nassimi, Director of the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. And Chris Loughran, Senior Policy Advisor at HALO. Uh, now, you can find their bios on the Big Tent website, and you can find out more about HALO by scanning the QR code on the postcards around the tent. Now, I'm just keeping an eye on these screens because I think there will be helpful, helpful info for you because we want to hear from you as well. Any questions, thoughts, ideas you may have when it comes to this session, please do uh, join in. But a small bit of housekeeping before we kick off, just a reminder that this is being recorded and live streamed. Um, we want to hear from you and you can either ask a question in a few minutes' time using this mic down here at the front. So feel free to come up, approach the mic, um, and obviously social distancing um, is welcome when it comes to queuing up. But if you'd rather ask a question electronically or even just make a comment, you can head to slido.com um, where you can enter the event number, uh, which is hashtag Big Tent 21, uh, and you'll be asked to select a tent. We're in the Queen of Flanders tent. Uh, and then you can enter your comment there and that'll appear on the screen. So you don't need to appear at the mic in person if you'd rather not. Uh, and just lastly, uh, if you're not eating or drinking, they've asked that you wear a face mask today. Uh, so I'll kick off with some questions first to our panellists to warm them up. Um, and then we'd love to hear from you. So uh, I'll go to Chris first uh, from the Halo Trust. Uh, now, Halo, of course, is famous, Chris, for its work uh, that Princess Diana carried out, a very high-profile uh, backing um, on landmine clearance. Now, how has HALO gone from landmine clearance to hosting this discussion about conflict in global Britain? Well, thanks for that. Very good to be here and, uh, and good to see you all. Um, the first thing to say, I think, is that landmines are still absolutely the heart of what the HALO Trust does. There's unfinished business in Angola, in Zimbabwe, in Sri Lanka, in Kosovo. So that's still at the heart of our work. But HALO wants to be the charity of today and tomorrow's issues, not just the charity that's working on the legacies of old war. And that's why we're so interested in conflict. Conflict didn't stop. It continues. It continues to evolve. It's getting more messy. It's getting more urban. And it's frankly not winding up. Conflicts are more protracted than ever. They're more dangerous than ever. And they're having a tremendous economic, environmental, and humanitarian cost. So that, that, that's why we're really interested in it. In terms of the global Britain element of it, we're at a pretty important crossroads when it comes to the approach to conflict in UK foreign policy. And that, that we've had 20 years of, of differing policies. After 9-11, we were very interventionist as the, as, as the UK. We went into Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and the consequences of that are well known to us all. But actually, the, year, the decade that followed, um, after 2010 financial crisis of uh, 2009, actually, we didn't do enough. We were very risk-averse. We were, we were non-interventionist. And so we lurched from being all over it to not being really active uh, in, in the right sort of way. And the consequences of both have been dire and played a part in generating this protracted conflict, endless wars that we can't do anything, uh, we aren't currently doing enough about and we can do plenty about it. So at the moment, Global Britain, it's the slogan that the UK government uses for its international strategy. At the moment, it's a slogan. We're a, a, a tremendous aid budget. We're a P5 member. We have a brilliant um, defence and diplomatic capability. We should be using that as the UK to take action on conflict, and that's what we'd like to promote and provoke here. Now, it, it's 10 years since the 
war began in Syria. There's been 20 years of intervention in Afghanistan. The Halo Trust works in a number of the current conflict zones. How do you do that as an organization without becoming involved? Well, I think it's a really, really good question, and it's one that's been at the heart of humanitarian work since its outset. And I think the first thing to say is that you must acknowledge that you're part of the ecosystem of what's going on. You're not just floating around in the conflict. You're actually, you know, you've got to relate to what's going on. And that's how every successful humanitarian organization uh, achieves what it does. It's by talking to people, gaining consent of different parties, gaining consent of communities. And it's important to remember that humanitarian principles, neutrality and so forth aren't just words. They're actually, they're, they're doing words. And you have to go out and explain to people why you're there, get their consent to be there. And, and that's how we've been able to operate in Afghanistan for the last 30 years. In some cases, if you don't have enough of a value system overlap with organizations, you can't operate. But in the vast majority of contexts, you can, and it's about talking and relating to them. The reason why Halo can do it so successfully as well is because 98 to 99% of our staff are from the countries they work in. They, they know what's going on, and that, that's absolutely critical to our success. Thanks, Chris. Um, a question now for Fabian Hamilton, MP. Now, uh, your portfolio on peace and disarmament is unique to the Labour shadow cabinet. Now, after 9-11, there was a decade of interventionism with Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya. Then we saw a, a decade of risk aversion when it came to Syria. And that didn't work either. What should the UK be doing now? Well, um, thank you, Sally, for the question. Um, firstly, just a bit about my role. Um, I'm probably one of the very few members of the shadow governmental team in the Labour Party not to shadow any government minister, so it's rather strange. Until um, last April, I did shadow the um, Minister of State for the Middle East and North Africa because I had that brief as well. Um, but now I just deal with arms treaties, arms, arms control, uh, peace and peace building. What should we do? We need to be much more proactive and use, as Chris said, our position within the United Nations. You know, we, we can punch well above our weight because, for historic reasons, because we're a member of the P5 of the Security Council. And that means we have a lot more influence than maybe we should have, given our current economic and geopolitical status. But let's use that. We're not using it at the moment as effectively as we can. The world needs far more coordination. Now, the late Kofi Annan, as Secretary General of the United Nations, once said to me and my colleagues, because we used to visit him regularly when I was on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, he used to say, look, I am not the president of the world. I'm the secretary general of the United Nations, and it's not the government of the world. Well, maybe we should try and rethink that. I know it's a, a very hard and tough call, because there, there's so many competing um, interests in the UN. But the fact is that unless we tackle, as Chris so rightly uh, put it, global conflict, it's going to continue to have an on cost, not just for the innocent people who are the victims of warfare and conflict worldwide. Syria obviously comes to mind, but Libya is pretty terrifying too. Never mind what's happened to the Rohingya uh, uh, peoples in Myanmar. Never mind Yemen, which is one of the most frightening, disturbing, and largest conflicts with the most displaced people since the Second World War. We can do something about this if we had the political will. But the political will seems lacking. And I agree with Chris's analysis that we had far too much intervention uh, while my party was in power. Indeed, I voted against every single conflict uh, because I don't believe conflict is the solution to international stress, tension, uh, and, and, and armed confrontation. The fact is we also need to control the arms trade because arms are important to defend your nation and I'm not a pacifist. I believe we should defend our country and use any means at our disposal to do that. But what I don't think is right is using the arms industry to make multi-billion pound profits for shareholders at the expense very often of the innocent. And let's look at Saudi Arabia. Uh, we, they're our biggest client. We sell billions of pounds worth of weapons to them every year. And where's the evidence pointing in Yemen? It's pointing clearly to British arms having been used to pursue that conflict. Never mind the rights and wrongs of what the Houthis are doing, and they're a really unpleasant bunch, but the fact is that British ordnance has been found in that conflict. That should be a source of shame to us. And the courts said that the British government should suspend all arms export licenses to Saudi Arabia, and I'm sorry to say, 
but the government has ignored that ruling. So we need the rule of law to continue, and governments have to obey the law too, but more importantly, we need to examine the arms trade worldwide and the causes of conflict, which can so often be rooted back to inequality and poverty. And are you confident that Labour would be doing things differently if they were in power? Absolutely, because... And what would that look like? Well, we, firstly, we have the political will to want to tackle these issues. We, we understand that, that inequality is a driver of conflict. Of course, inequality in resources, not just financial inequality. We understand also that the arms trade does need to be reined in. And one of the things we're working on, it may sound really boring and technical, is to make the Committee on Arms Export Control of the House of Commons, currently a kind of side committee of, that comprises other MPs from other committees, into a proper select committee. And people may say, well, that's really boring and technical. But actually, what effect does it have? Select committees are increasingly powerful in our parliament. I heard George Freeman say earlier that it's, it's, it's important that MPs assert themselves from all parties for what they believe is right and hold governments to account. And, and I think through a select committee, we can actually pre-vet export licenses and reduce the number of weapons that are sent to rogue regimes used in conflict. But it's not just the UK. Among many governments, no, no. there seems to be a reticence about getting involved after so much intervention with Iraq and Afghanistan. It is politically yeah. risky now for, for governments to get involved in conflict. But you can't be a force for good and stick your head in the, head in the sand. No. So where would you strike that balance if United Labour Nations. were in power? Sally, the United Nations. You know, we are, we are, the United Nations is, is, is really imperfect. Uh, it needs wholesale reform. We need to bring in some of the emerging powers in the world economically uh, and geopolitically. But the fact is, it's all we've got. And I think that we need to use it much more effectively. And we're in a position to do that. Why aren't we doing it? That's what we would do. Fabian, thank you. Uh, question for Mandy now. Uh, now, you've worked extensively in the Middle East. You lived in East Jerusalem for eight years. What are your reflections to the UK's approach to conflict in the region, and has it got anything right? Thank you. Um, well, I think before we ta start talking about the UK's approach to conflict in the region, we need to talk about the UK's approach to the region in general. Um, but we could be here all day doing that. So I just want to focus on two things, first of which I know quite a lot about, which is the Israel-Palestine conflict. And the second, which I think everybody in the UK has um, been forced to consider, is the, the crisis in Yemen, and Fabian's already talked about that. So in terms of the Israel-Palestine conflict, um, having worked in East Jerusalem for eight years um, as the director of our British Academy Research Centre, working very closely with the British Council and the British Consul General, I saw there was a, a, a lot of issues there that were problematic. Now, Britain cannot undo the historic injustice that was created during its colonial rule, but it can support self-determination for the Palestinian people now. And what we see is a contradictory policies uh, on uh, the behalf of the British government. What the Palestinian people are asking for is um, their own state, their own sovereign state. And unfortunately, in 2012, when that was taken to the United Nations, Britain abstained in the vote for uh, recognising Palestine as a state. Um, and that's despite the fact that two years later, British MPs voted overwhelmingly in the Houses of Parliament for um, an independent uh, sovereign Palestinian state. And opinion polls in Britain consistently show that British people want to see an independent Palestinian state also. So I would argue that the British government really needs to listen to its own MPs and its own people on this very issue. Um, now, when I arrived in, in East Jerusalem in 2012, the, the British Consul General at the time was um, Sir Vincent Fien, who subsequently came back to the UK and retired and is now um, uh, very actively set up a, a project called the Balfour Project, which has its, its role to um, support uh, self-determination and statehood for, for Palestine. So I would um, urge you all to have a look at what the Balfour Project does. I think it's doing a lot of good. Um, I also would uh, urge the UK government to support the forthcoming um, International Criminal Court investigation into war crimes in the occupied territory. Um, this could stop settlement expansion. 
this could stop military rule over Palestinians and end what is now a 54-year occupation, which human rights organizations such as Human Rights Watch and even Israel's own B'Tselem are now calling an apartheid regime. I think it's an incumbent upon the British government to have a policy on Palestinian independence, and I think that this would, this would actually help Britain's uh, reputation massively in the region. The second issue that I wanted to highlight, and I was glad to hear Fabian talk about that, is, and also very interested to hear about Fabian's role um, in terms of disarmament, is I think the UK at the very minimum should stop selling weapons to the Saudi Arabian regime um, and provide an expert personnel. The United States embargoed its weapon sales to Saudi Arabia in February this year after a call from the United Nations. But the United Kingdom has so far not stopped selling weapons. It's even ignoring a court of appeal decision last year to stop selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's no way that the UK can be seen to be helping to build peace while selling weapons to one side. Um, I think this is absolutely crucial. So why is the UK following these two policies? And this is where the wider discussion on the UK's relationship to the Middle East comes in particularly its military relationships, and I absolutely agree, agree with Fabian here, is that we need to talk about weapons sales. Um, these are not promoting peace, particularly uh, in Yemen, and particularly not in, in Palestine either. So I would say that these are the two main issues that I'd like to talk about. I think the, the issue is, is that, and I really fully agree with Fabian here, is that if Britain, if Britain wants to propose itself as a supporter of the rule of law, as being an essential part of global peace and prosperity, then it itself needs to adhere to the rule of law, including international law. If Britain also wants to propose itself as a beacon of democracy, then it should follow what its own MPs and populations want. So I think these are two crucial aspects. And I absolutely agree that the United Nations is not, um, there's problems with the UN, but it's the only thing we have in terms of multi multilateralism. And we should be going to the UN and speaking to our partners there. The second question is a bit more difficult. Has Britain got anything right? Well, firstly, um, in terms of Palestine, at least the United Kingdom did not follow um, Donald Trump's lead, his highly divisive policies, which was to move the American embassy to Jerusalem to uh, take budget support away from the uh, United Nations Reliefs and Works Agencies, which is the, the refugee agency supporting Palestinian refugees. So Britain did continue to support UNRWA, and it did continue to give budget support to the Palestinian Authority, and I think that that was one thing that it did right. The wider thing that I think that they've got right is the British Council. I think the British Council does absolutely fabulous work worldwide, but particularly in the Middle East. Um, in the Middle East, lots of people want to have connections with Britain culturally, educationally, and I think the British Council gets it right every time. So I would give a big shout out to the British Council. Mandy, thank you. Moving on to Shabnam now. Obviously, Afghanistan is very topical with the withdrawal of NATO uh, troops, and that brings an end as well to the UK's lengthy military presence in the country. Shabnam, can the UK make any meaningful contribution to a stable and peaceful Afghanistan without NATO? Thank you, Sally. Um, well, first of all, I think as a British Afghan myself um, and millions of others in Afghanistan, um, we'd like to pay tribute to the British servicemen um, who gave up their lives in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. Um, almost 450 men and women um, fought courageously against um, uh, insurgent groups and the Taliban, um, and they had a key role in the progress that Afghanistan made. So we're grateful, and I, I don't think it's something where we're going to take for granted. Um, Afghanistan has faced, in the last 20 years, in the last two decades, it's not been an easy journey. It was a struggle both for Afghanistan in terms of building it, it, its state, but also um, uh, for, uh, the UK um, and it, the role it had in the country. But that doesn't take away from the enormous um, changes that Britain made to Afghanistan. Prior to th 2001, um, there was no infrastructure. 
girls could not go to school. Um, there was no freedom, there was no liberty. People could not express themselves openly. Um, there was no health system. I mean, like, the list can go on. I mean, we, the, the, uh, Britain was able to not only support the governance of the state, um, it was able to invest in terms of economic development, the billions of aid that went in, the investment, the attention. Um, so aside from military intervention, you know, the, the, the key uh, in terms of going to Afghanistan in 2001 was to prevent terrorist groups um, from um, using Afghanistan as a safe haven um, and becoming a threat to the security of, of the West. But aside from that, you know, UK concentrated heavily in terms of building Afghanistan into becoming a credible, transparent, accountable state. Um, and it's something I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, and I, I hear this often that, I mean, Afghanistan is made up of almost over 70% of under 25s. Um, so it's a very, very young population. Um, and the last 20 years has been a huge opportunity for this new generation of work, of um, education. It was thriving. I mean, I visited Afghanistan uh, starting 2007 every other year or every year. Um, and the conversations I had, it was astonishing to see that they spoke uh, better English in Afghanistan than a lot of Afghans do in the UK. Um, so it was very, I was very proud to see what had happened. Um, the U, I mean, Biden decided to leave Afghanistan last year after the Doha agreement between the Taliban with no conditions set um, and basically gave away all the cards um, and yet still wanted the Taliban to sit around the table and talk about peace. Now, I mean, I'm no senior politician, but it seems like the basic uh, way towards getting the opponents into a sit around the table is you've got to hold something for them to come forward and you just gave everything away. Um, so th there was that fault initially uh, of making that, that huge mistake. Moving forward, I think myself and so many Afghans had hope that the Taliban would sit down and talk about peace. And a lot of Afghans were open to that idea. They wanted to find a conclusion to this endless war. But I think we made huge mistakes over the last 18 months. Um, and now the UK is leaving. It's almost, it's gonna leave before the September 11. I think the, the, the last date will be end of uh, July uh, from, from what I've heard. C uh, CIA um, and also MI6 have already stated that there is a huge risk of Afghanistan returning back to a terrorist state if we, if we leave in such an irresponsible manner. Now, I'm not saying that we want Britain to be stationed there forever. It is a costly war, it is a painful war, and it has taken a lot uh, when it comes to sort of British natural interests as, uh, national interests as well. But I think it, it's about how do we ensure that this last 20 years, the lives that have been lost are not, have not gone in vain. Um, you know, what's the point of building all of this and then leaving, letting it all, sort of abandoning it, abandoning it, letting it all be destroyed, and then potentially, I mean, I think I read a piece today in the Evening Standard saying that we may well um, uh, end up going back. And just on that, Shavnam, is there a sense in Afghanistan, because we were talking before we came on stage here and you still have family there. The situation, the security situation is deteriorating rapidly there. Is there a sense among Afghan people that they've been abandoned? I wrote a piece for The Telegraph about a couple of days ago. Um, and it's uh, the, 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 the key, the, the sort of subject was Afghans feel betrayed. It was a betrayal by Western power, with the, the West. And so many people got back in touch with me say, saying thank you from Afghanistan on the ground, saying thank you so much, Shabnam, for saying this, because no one seems to, 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 to openly um, convey their message of betrayal. And, and I said, well, it had to be said. And this was a woman, a young woman journalist, uh, and she said, you know, the West and particularly Britain came into Afghanistan, gave everyone such high hopes for a huge, beautiful future uh, where women, particularly women, had a very key staple role in society. And you've taken that away practically. And I think when it comes to Britain's involvement, um, potentially, I think with the integrated review as well, the, the, the historic um, inter British intervention in terms of military intervention is something that we're sort of moving away from. 
But there's definitely other key relationships we need to keep hold, uh, hold of. Soft power, British, British soft power has had a huge role in the region and the influence that we have. Afghanistan is now at risk of um, being sort of other uh, neighboring countries, China, Iran, Russia, are already putting their hands in. China's, I think, already has uh, pledged around 62 billion towards reconstruction programs. So we're opening up that vacuum, that space for the, the countries that you know are no, we know are very, in many ways, corrupt, um, to take advantage of this war. Um, they are going to be working very closely with the Taliban. I think there was an agreement already made, made between China and the Taliban that the Taliban will not say anything in terms of the Uyghur genocide as long as mm -hmm. China supports the Taliban. So it's a lot of you know, games being played. And I think it's British, Britain's responsibility and, and moral obligation to make sure that doesn't happen. Too many games have been played in Afghanistan. It's, it's, Britain has made a huge uh, contribution, and, and it's something I'm proud of. And I've seen the, 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 the changes, the, the real changes that this country has made. I want to make sure that these are not uh, destroyed, they're not abandoned. And it's not something where we've spent so much money we end up having to go back a couple of years uh, again, uh, after again and having to reconstruct everything again. I yeah. mean, yeah, we've got to use what we've made so far. Now, I have personally a lot of more questions for all of you. We haven't even got onto ISIS yet. The caliphate may be gone, but the ideology is still there, and we're seeing uh, ISIS reorganize themselves in Afghanistan, Africa. Uh, we can talk more in a, in a minute among ourselves, but I really want to open questions up to the floor. Uh, to hear from any of you before we continue. There's just a microphone here. Feel free to approach. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Julian. I'm, I'm a member of the Green Party, but actually what I'm going to say probably isn't mainstream Green Party. Position, first of all, I want to really thank the last speaker because I think that, you know, for those of us on the left, if you like, we, we don't listen to the voices in the region and in, and in all these conflict situations carefully enough. Too often we apply a lens based on historic theoretical positions which, which don't work. And based on that, I want to sort of challenge something that Fabian said where he talked about, you know, voting against all those conflicts as if they were all the same. You know, the, 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 the illegal intervention in Iraq was one thing. The attempt to apply a no-fly zone to Libya was an entirely different thing. Only 72 civilians died because of that. The mistake was actually not to follow it up. That was about standing in solidarity with people fighting a dictatorship. Similarly, in Syria, the solidarity with, with, with the uprisings in Syria is an entirely different idea to, 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 to um, regime change intervention. And I think that we make a huge mistake by conflating all those things. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Fabian, your thoughts on that? <laughs> Well, I'm sorry you feel that I was lumping them all together. I think the point I was trying to make was not that they're all the same, because they're not, but that the answer to those crises is UK or NATO military intervention. I, I just think, look at the history of military intervention by this country or by NATO forces. And yes, we've heard from Shabnam about Afghanistan. Actually, I don't think we had a vote on Afghanistan. I don't remember having a vote. But we certainly had one on Syria. And, and I, I thought about it very carefully and weighed it up because I was under pressure by the leadership to vote uh, with the party to support the then government of the coalition government for intervention. But I just looked at what, what have we done over the decades and centuries, certainly decades in the last 20, 30 years. How have we improved the lives of the people who suffered as a result of conflict? Now, Afghanistan, I think, is different, and I accept everything Shabnam says. She's absolutely right, and I'm sorry, in a way, that we're abandoning the people there to uh, the Taliban and what they're likely to do. But, you know, voting against Iraq was one thing, and a lot of people were happy that I represented my constituents' views as well as my own on that. Syria, I felt, actually, that our intervention was not going to change anything. What we needed was the United Nations to be involved, not an intervention by a coalition of the willing, as somebody once said. Um, Libya, now I've been doing a lot of work on Libya, and the problem with Libya is that there are so many competing interests that want a slice of their oil. They're not interested in governance, the rule of law, in proper government being set up in Tripoli. On the one hand, Tripoli is recognized by the UN Security Council as the legitimate government 
in charge of Libya. On the other hand, the French are selling weapons to, uh, to General Haftar, Khalifa Haftar, who is the rebel leader coming from Benghazi. So how can you kind of square those two things? It is a free-for-all where the Russians are pursuing their own agenda, where clearly the Turks are pursuing their agenda, um, and who's paying the price? And I would argue it's not those troops. It's actually the people of Libya who are living in utter chaos and lawlessness. Now, do we think that UK military intervention or NATO intervention will help that? I don't believe so. I think the, the United Nations has to take a very strong hand in this and knock some heads together. And we can help do that, actually, as the pen holder on the Security Council. We're not doing it. We need to. We've had a few questions come in electronically as well, so I'll, I'll put the most pithy question to you first, given that time is short. Uh, does the UK have a conflict strategy? If not, what should one look like? I'll open that to Chris and Mandy first. Great, thank you. It, it's a great question. Um, the, uh, there is a conflict strategy under development, and if you start with the positives, conflict appears in the integrated review in a good way, not just conflict prevention but conflict is something the UK should be working on. So that's a good thing. The other good thing is the Foreign Secretary has actually put conflict in a sensible way in his development priorities. The bad news is that there's no consultation ongoing about what that should look like. There's no expertise like HALOs or, or others being drawn on, despite us offering it, despite us saying, oh, look, talk to us, we know, we know about this. And, and so the, the, the risk is that a strategy is developed on paper in Whitehall, falls well short, and people carry on as normal. So a strategy should, first of all, be uh, consultative. It should draw together the different elements, as we said at the beginning, of the, the UK's uh, assets and what it can do. And it needs to have a budget, and it needs to be a sensible budget, not just a very small amount of money, less than 2% of bilateral ODA in 2019-20 was spent on conflict directly, our conflict resolution. We need something that's meaningful and actually commensurate to uh, the, the, the country as, as, as we should be playing a role. And just on that issue of a new conflict strategy, I mean, what are the alternatives to the intervention that we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan and then the risk aversion that we saw in Syria, Mandy or Fabian? I mean, what would, what would a new conflict strategy look like? Wow. Though or what should I, it look like? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree, I agree with Chris. I think that the, the government has a, a, a prime opportunity to consult with organisations like the Halo Trust and others who work in the region um, and work globally in conflict zones, and they're not doing that. One would hope that they would um, start to, to have these discussions because I feel that, especially, it, for example, in the Middle East, um, I think they, one of the aspects of anti-British sentiment in the region, for example, is the belief that the UK is underwriting uh, the autocratic order, um, particularly through its support for Gulf states. So I think Britain really needs to rethink its, its foreign policy, particularly uh, in the Middle East. And again, as I say, I would urge them to support uh, the emergence of an independent Palestinian state. I think that would do a lot to repair the damage um, of Britain's reputation in the region. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, another question that we've had in, as government policies change in the UK on a different time frame compared to the length of some current conflicts, what role do humanitarian agencies have in stabilising conflict areas? Probably for you with that one, Chris. Well, I think stabilisation is an area where the UK can play a particularly significant role. We, so we talked about soft power and the, the British Council and, and the, the media freedoms and all of that really important work that the UK does. Then at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, you know, the, the NATO interventions and the trouble that's come with those. In the middle, there's rule of law. There's making, supporting stable societies. There's investing in, uh, in those power vacuums that otherwise, as Shabnam says, other people that don't share our values will go into that space. Um, and I think it's really important to note that the public supports this. There's a, there's a key assumption that Brexit, the Brexiteers who voted for Conservatives in 2019 are a one-issue a one organisation and Coalition for Global, Global Prosperity is here. They've done some fantastic polling. Actually, that's not true. People expect the... UK to do sensible, sensible stuff, to act with values, to be a projecting good and, and, and our values overseas. And that, that, that bit between the soft power and the hard power, the middle ground of stabilisation, is where humanitarian organisations like Halo Trust and others want to be working. Are there any more questions from the floor? You, yes, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on one of the points uh, made around the Security Council in particular. Doesn't the conflict in Syria demonstrate that the Security Council 
as an organisation is uh, flawed. If you have different um, countries on the Security Council who are unable to, uh, that have wildly divergent interests. And then, if I might, two for the price of one. Uh, I, we've talked a lot about uh, ongoing conflicts. I wondered at what level you would rate the risk of a major conflict between different members of the Security Council over the next decade. Was that for you, Fabian? <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, so I'm trying to write it down. Um, so on the chances of conflict, well, I think that's too appalling to contemplate conflict between the existing Security Council members because, you know, ha has humanity learnt nothing? We set up the United Nations and its Security Council following the Second World War to try and ensure that such wars never happened again. And I, I find it, I know there are a lot of conflicts, verbal conflicts, and a lot of competition between the Security Council members, especially the P5, but the prospect of conflict between China and the US, Russia and the US, uh, and the UK, I think is too horrific to contemplate. I, I sincerely hope, and I'm not party, sadly, to those uh, discussions, I'm not a fly on the wall there, but I sincerely hope that humanity and common sense prevails and that the people on those councils and their governments remember why they were set up in the first place and what the cost of human conflict actually is, not just in financial terms, but in industrial development planetary terms, the cost to our environment, the trillions that are spent on arms and conflict, which could be spent on saving the earth and feeding everybody and giving them clean water, uh, as well as looking after, of course, all life on the planet. You know, the idea that we're going to bring into play these nuclear arsenals, by the way, 98% of which are owned between, 97%, I think, between Russia and the United States, and destroy the planet several times over, is so horrific that we've got to work much harder for, to reduce those numbers of nuclear weapons, not increase them by 80 warheads, as the current integrated review of the British government is aiming to do, but actually reduce them worldwide, make the non-proliferation treaty far more effective, ensure that people stick to the obligations that they've signed up to, and not have the hypocrisy of telling the Iranians under the JCPOA they cannot have nuclear weapons when we're increasing our arsenal and so are some other countries too. So I think that that is, you know, in the end, uh, we, are, we have the gift of language and intelligent thought. You do sometimes wonder, don't you, when you see what goes on. But let's harness that for the benefit of all of humanity and life on Earth. We've got to have the much broader picture here. And when we analyze why these conflicts occur, one of the main reasons after climate change is, as I said earlier, inequality. Inequality in water, in resources, in money. The aid, you know, we've just cut our aid budget. I heard Penny Morden earlier say, well, she actually does regret that. But if we had 1%, of the turnover of the City of London going towards international development aid, it would actually multiply global aid by seven times, seven times over, and that would solve many of the problems uh, that actually fuel conflict. So, as I say, come back to the soft power that we have. We've mentioned the British Council. The BBC World Service, I think, hasn't been mentioned. It played a huge part, I know, in Afghanistan. Uh, we have some remarkable NGOs. I, just want to use this opportunity to pay my tribute to the Halo Trust because I've worked with them uh, for a while now and I think they're absolutely brilliant. But there's loads of NGOs out there that can also have an effect in preventing conflict before it starts. And the final thing I just want to say about conflict is we have excellent armed forces. Now, their job is to defend our country uh, and, where necessary, to use uh, lethal force. But worldwide, I think you'd agree with this, Chris, and Mandy probably would, our forces, and certainly you would, Shabnam, they are trusted as not being corrupt, not going out there with the sole purpose of killing, but actually providing humanitarian relief too. Let's retask our excellent military who are well-trained, well-organized, trusted worldwide, incorruptible, to save life rather than take life. And that, I think, would make a huge difference. Um, and if we could talk to other countries in the world with large military forces. Turkey comes to mind, obviously, they have a huge force there. To use it rather than just for national interest, for human, worldwide interest. It's, it's I know, it, you may say I'm living in cloud cuckoo land here, but unless you've got ideals, 
you'll never achieve anything. You've got to look to those values and ideals first and work right across party. That's why I think this event is so good. And I heard George Freeman say that earlier, that we're trying to get, get rid of the party labels and talk about what is best for humanity across all different political views. We've got one aim in mind, to make this world a better place, our society a better place, our cities and our country a better place. Let's keep that in mind rather than narrow sectional interest and profits for corporations. Thank you, Fabian. You talk about ideals there and values, but even in the face of a global pandemic, uh, which the world has been battling together in the last year, the UN Secretary General called for a ceasefire, but most conflict continued. Uh, and of course, people are dealing with issues much closer to home when it comes to this public health crisis and the economic fallout, pushing tens of millions of people into poverty. Just a final thought from anyone from the floor or indeed from the panelists on the public mood when it comes to conflict. Your thoughts, Shabnam. I think the, the last um, 12 to 18 months has definitely um, heavily impacted not only Britain but internationally. COVID has been um, something that we've had to face as a sort of united global community. And, and I think that's also impacted the, the, the manner in which conflict continues. Um, unfortunately, though, I, I mean, I know that the integrated view in Britain is looking towards intervention in, in, in other ways other than military. Um, but in countries like Afghanistan, it's not looking like it's going to end anytime soon. Um, and what I hope to see, and I mean, someone mentioned uh, a conflict strategy, with, with, with UK conflict strategy, and the way that we move forward. The key here is to potentially hold inquiries, particularly for Afghanistan, in that we consult and figure out where we went wrong, what some of the mistakes were that we made, so that that could hopefully also impact the way we move forward. Um, so it is a time for reflection. It's time to look forward. Um, and like you said, this, these sort of conversations are so important. But um, co consulting with NGOs on the ground, British Council is, is an, an amazing organization internationally, and so many other humanitarian um, NGOs like Halo Trust as well. They provide expertise, intelligence from the ground that needs, that needs to be reflected when it comes to um, uh, the inter integrated review or a conflict strategy. I mean, um, the Foreign Office is now, um, um, uh, is, is now working together in terms of uh, aid and, and, and development as well. So that also requires for us to look at conflict, not just in terms of war, but actually humanitarian development assistance. Those two play a very close relationship and a key role. So in terms of looking forward, it's to see what Britain's um, position is globally um, for a force for good and not something that we'll, we'll regret in 10, 20, 50 years to come. Shabnam, thank you. And just one final thought from the floor. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, intrigued, uh, Fabian, in your last comments. You referred to uh, the, the ideals that drive these things and the fact that this event is about drawing different voices together. That's extremely welcome. But I'd just like to understand how it is that you think that's uh, a positive force, but you failed to really engage with either the first or the last speakers from the panel, or indeed our first questioner. When it comes to issues such as, in, uh, 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 as engagement, as in uh, taking an active role in many of these conflicts, you, as you said in your own voting record, you've always said no. And yet the two speakers that we have who are on the ground have talked about the necessity of that, have talked about the, the value that it has brought. You talk about, you ask your uh, a rhetorical question, your speech, saying uh, what benefits have any of these things brought you have speakers here who are telling you that this is the thing that works you're not engaging you talk about your ideals but you're not engaging with the practical reality that physically getting on the ground and putting boots on the ground for people who've been trained in conflict who've been trained how to manage it and indeed our armed forces are already trained in how to reduce conflict from the most smallest stages of taking off glasses before it is that you engage with someone. How to resolve, how to de-escalate. It's one of the things that already happens. So you've got a, a speech that you've given several times over where you've talked about the, uh, the, the ideals that are needed by the history, but it's in direct conflict with the information that's being presented around you of what practically works. That the history on the ground in Afghanistan is one that is respected where the UK is concerned. It is one that is added to it. And I'd just like to ask, in the spirit of the big tent, why are you not engaging with the people who don't have the same views as yourself? Well, I don't think that's very fair, if I may, Sally. I mean, what did I just say about our military? That they are trusted worldwide. 
that they actually have done a brilliant job in de-escalating conflict. You've just said that yourself. So I, I don't think it's right to say that we should just step back and say you can get on with it. it, it and yet that's your own voting record. No, well, yet your that, comments... Sorry, you challenged me to, to say, what did you say? You, you, you said that they should be retrained in peace rather than defence, when indeed that already happens. That just shows an ignorance of the way in which military forces are, are already trained and prepared. I didn't say retrained, I said retasked, actually, and I think that's slightly different, because they're already trained, as you say, in trying to de-escalate conflict, and that's why they're so well regarded. But, I, I mean, you're painting a picture of somebody who just wants to sort of laissez-faire, sort of leave people to get on with it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, tr I'm trying to paint a picture of why these conflicts take place in the first place and what we can do to stop them happening before they start. That's the important thing. And, and did I not just say to Shabnam that I thought what we did in Afghanistan was really good, but unfortunately, we're withdrawing. I'm agreeing with what she said. So I don't think that's disengaging. I think you're rather painting a slightly exaggerated picture of what I've been saying. Okay. We, we welcome all thoughts and views. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Fabian, for responding. My turn to de-escalate um, that. And to thank you all for coming today uh, and taking part uh, in this session hosted uh, by the Halo Trust. Thank you very much indeed to all of you and to our four panelists. Thank you.